Amen. Good morning, Highview. If you have your Bibles, please take them and find James chapter 4 this morning. As we're continuing our preaching series called On Display through the book of James, and this morning we're going to be in chapter 4, verses 4 through 12. Um, football season is just a couple of weeks away. And so for those of us who wear red, that is an exciting time of year. Uh, for those of us uh, who wear blue, it's an exciting time of year for the next few weeks. And uh, <laughs> I, love, I love football. I've played it all my life. And when I was in college, uh, I had a coach who would always say this phrase that will forever stick in my mind. He would say this every single day before we went to practice. He'd say, guys, today you've got a choice to make. You can either get better or you can get worse, but there is no gray area. Remember that like it was yesterday. He said that every single day. Today you can either get better or you can get worse, but there is no gray area. And here's what he wanted us to understand. Our coach wanted us to understand that between uh, being excellent and being mediocre, those two things are mutually exclusive. Right? They both can't be true at the same time. Um, winning and losing, he said, those are mutually exclusive. Making gains and suffering losses, mutually exclusive. They both can't be true at the same time. And so he wanted us to feel the weight of that when we were going out on the practice field that either you were doing things in order to get better or at the same time you were actually doing things to get worse. And there's no gray area. That's kind of the flavor that we get from James chapter 4 this morning. James is going to give us two things that are mutually exclusive. Two things that cannot be true at the same time. And it's this, godliness and worldliness. Right? He's going to say that you cannot love God and love the world at the same time. They're mutually exclusive. So exclusive, in fact, that he says, if you love the world at the same time, it's actually hatred for God. He's going to say that God is the enemy of those who love the world. So, man, this is a, needless to say, this is a challenging text. This is a text that, that is not going to feel good to us this morning. We may leave here with some sore toes this morning. Because this is a text that we need. This is a text that we need to heed to because here's the issue with, with our lives every single day. We are constantly inundated with the pressures and the views and the lenses of the world. And if we're not careful, we can become to, to be lulled to sleep about the seriousness of sin against God. Now, I know some people who uh, are Christians and in an effort to be relevant with the world end up looking just like it. And James says we need to be warned that that type of lifestyle, those types of affections make us the enemy of God. So we need this word. And what we need out of this word is not just to be convicted, but we need the gospel of Jesus Christ to uproot the worldliness out of our hearts and make us exclusively his. We're going to see three things in this passage this morning if you're taking notes and want to write them down. First thing that we're going to see is that God is against our worldliness. God is against our worldliness. Number two, we're going to see that God's grace purifies our worldliness. God's grace purifies our worldliness. And number three, God calls us to love others through their worldliness. So if you're able to stand, I want you to stand, and we're going to begin reading James 4, starting in verse 4. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. 
Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Let's pray. Holy Spirit, for the next few moments, would you just deal with our hearts? Expose the worldly tendencies of our lives and point us to the glorious, saving, changing gospel of Jesus Christ and his grace. We'll pray that humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The first thing that we see in verse 4 is that God is against our worldliness. Look at the text in verse 4. He says, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? James at this point in the text has taken off the gloves. He's not holding any punches here. He calls his readers adulterous people, meaning that they are supposed to be in covenant relationship with one, but they are giving themselves and their hearts to another. James is speaking here about people who profess to to love Christ, who profess to have affections for Christ and to be his bride and to belong to him alone, yet at the same time, they are willingly giving their affections to something or someone else, namely the world. And like a, a spouse who has broken their marriage vows, like a spouse who has pledged faithfulness and fidelity to their husband or their wife and stepped outside of that commitment, he says, you adulterers. And this adultery is against none other than God. He goes on to ask this question in the next phrase. He says, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself the enemy of God. Now, we live in a culture, guys, that doesn't like to talk about God in any way that would make him someone to be uh, feared, right? We want a a God that is is polite and easy to swallow. We want a God who's kind of like Colonel Sanders. You know, he's always got a smile on his face, and he wants you to do good, but if you don't, that's okay because he won't get too angry. He's a God of love, right? So we don't really have a category for a a verse in the Bible that says God can actually be your enemy. God can actually be against you. We really don't have a category for that. But yet, if we're going to be Bible-believing Christians who love Jesus and are exclusively his and make a difference for Jesus in the world, we've got to know what the Bible teaches about the full character of God. So Psalms 21 describes God this way. It says, your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. You will make them as a blazing oven when you appear. The Lord will swallow them up in his wrath and fire will consume them. And then Nahum chapter 1 says it this way. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. Brothers and sisters, God is love. God is gracious. God is merciful. You won't meet anybody more gracious and merciful than God, but God is also holy. Right, the Bible describes God as a consuming fire. Hebrews chapter 10 says it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And sometimes I think it might be that we don't think worldliness is that big of a deal because we don't think that God is that big of a deal. 
I can think of 10,000 things that I would rather have as my enemy than the living God. And James here says that we can actually have God as our enemy. He was against us if we are the friends of the world. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be the friend of the world makes himself the enemy of God. Friendship in the Bible is a, a strong word. Friendship in the Bible has a much deeper meaning than what we usually understand friendship. Jesus describes friendship in the Bible as greater love hath no man than this, than he who would lay down his life for a friend. Right, so you can see why James is so, so sharp with his words. Friendship is not a light thing. Friendship is having such a deep affection for that you would actually make sacrifices for that friendship. And so just like my coach says, there's really no gray area. If we want to be the friends of the world, we make ourselves in opposition with God. We take the glory of God that belongs to him, his honor, his glory, and we give it to the things that he has made. And there's really no gray area. God is against our worldliness. It was important that we kind of understand this morning what worldliness looks like in an everyday uh, basis, some practical things about worldliness. First John chapter two gives us this about worldliness. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. So John here says that worldliness, if we're trying to take notes this morning and figure out what worldliness looks like in our lives, he says, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, boastful pride of life. Lust of the flesh is all about uh, self-gratification, right? Where the driving question in life is, what is it that makes me happy? What is it that I want? I make all of my decisions based on what makes me happy instead of what brings God glory, right? So who do I date? Who would I get married to? Should I stay married? What type of entertainment do I enjoy? The bottom line driving question is, what makes me happy? It's all about me. It's not about the glory of God, not about the will of God, not about the design of God, but about me. That's the lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes, then, is about self-fulfillment, right? And the bottom line question here is, what do I not have that if I had it, it would make me complete, Right, so this is the heart that is never satisfied until it has bigger and better and newer and more. And guys, is this not in our face every single day in American culture? Right, we have a consumer-driven culture where in, in our culture, you can't be satisfied, you can't be content with the iPhone 7, you've got to have the iPhone 8. Right, you can't be content with the 2015 Chevy, you've got to have the 2018 Chevy. And you've got to have the newer house and the bigger TV and the next and the next and the next, and it's all just this striving after the wind. Right, trying to satisfy ourselves with things that were not meant to fulfill us. And that's why um, researchers say that, that probably eight out of 10 Americans live in debt. And this is really not something that the church is exempt from because many Christians, dare I say, most Christians in this church for sure do not tithe. And the reason why, I believe, is because most of what we have goes towards paying off debt from trying to keep up with the Joneses. This is one of those ouch or amen kind of sermons. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. Then he says boastful pride of life. And, and this is all about self-promotion. Right? This is all about trying to figure out what makes me bigger and more important and more superior to another person. Or in the eyes of another person. The pride of life is really what drives the quarreling and the fighting that we see in the first couple of verses of this chapter. The pride of life is really what drives the favoritism and the partiality that James talks about in chapter two. 
And Pastor Aaron said it well, he covered it thoroughly, but it needs to be said, it's what's driving the racism and, and the hatred and the things that we see in our country today. Pride of life, what happened in Charlottesville, Virginia is worldliness. Right, white supremacy, racial supremacy, hatred for another group of people because of what they look like is sinful and worldly, and it is the enemy of the cross of Christ. Where Jesus shed his blood to make all of humanity into one new man in Christ. And man, may it be that the people of God, this church, the body of Christ would speak against that and stand against that because God is against that. God is against the alt-right movement because the alt-right movement is against God and those made in his image. God is against our worldliness. Notice what he says in verse five. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? Now this is an interesting verse depending on what version of the Bible you read. There's typically two kind of interpretations for this, and we're not gonna get into the technical stuff, but here's kind of two things that are true. I wanna land on a principle this morning. Two things that are true that we see all throughout the Bible. Number one is that God is a jealous God, right? God has a divine jealousy for you and for me that he wants us to belong to him exclusively. That's how this verse reads. Right, but it's also true that we have a, a spirit, a lowercase s, a heart that yearns and is jealous for the things of the world. And that's kind of what he's getting at here is this double-mindedness of God wants you, but you naturally want the world. Right, that's kind of what's here. That's the tension that's here. God desires you, but your heart naturally desires the world. And there's a tension there, and there will always be a tension until we repent from our worldliness and become exclusively his. Here's been my prayer all week as I was preparing for this sermon is that we would understand this. Listen, that God will not share you with the world. He loves you too much. God will not share you with the world. He doesn't want to be important in your life. He wants to be ultimate in your life. And it's right because he's worth that. And we know that it is a righteous thing for him to be jealous for our affections. Every person in this room knows that that's a righteous thing. I'll give you an example of, of how we know that. How many of you ladies, if your husband were to come to you and say, babe, I'm seeing three women in my life right now, just three, but of all three of them, you're number one. Right? When it comes to giving them my time and giving them my thoughts, of all three of them, you're the most important. How many of us that's flying in our house? Right, that's not gonna fly in our house because you're, the, you're jealous for the desires and the affections of your husband and rightfully so. Husbands are the same way, so how much more would God be jealous for our affections? The God that made you, the God that put his image upon your soul, the God who allowed his son to be crushed and punished to make you his. He's jealous for us and he is against our worldliness. That's number one. Here's number two, look at verse six, and here's kind of where it gets good. He says this, but he gives, what's your Bible say? More grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. This is the most encouraging verse in the entire book of James. How many of you, we've been going through this book throughout this summer, and you've been looking at this thing like, man, I don't know if I'm able to live the things that Christ is calling me to. And right? if you're feeling that, let me give you some freeing news this morning. You can't. And that is why we need the grace of God in Jesus Christ. He says he gives us more grace. I don't know about you, but in my life, I am so thankful that God puts a comma in my story and not a period. Because I know who I used to be. And man, I was studying for this passage this week, and I kept tripping up on that word, more grace. Right, how is it, God, that I can be living for the things of the world, running in unfaithfulness away from you, and you're pursuing me with more grace? Not just grace, more grace. 
Meaning that God's got more forgiveness than you've got worldliness. God's got more love than you've got sin. And I don't know how we can read this verse if you're a believer and this doesn't do something to your spirit. I don't know how we can read this and think, God, how on earth the gospel makes no sense? How could you love someone like me? He says he gives more grace. Romans chapter 5 lays it out like this in verse 20. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Abounding grace means it's not just more grace, it's overwhelmingly more grace. And there may be some of you in here in this room who you've done some things and you're constantly doing some things and you're wondering, is there hope for you? There is hope for you because of the abounding grace of God in Jesus Christ. Listen, guys, we preach a gospel. We preach a gospel about a man who was slain for the forgiveness of sin, who gives us a free gift. That's what grace means. It's a free gift. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. He gives it to us that we might stand righteous before God. And at the cross, Jesus became the enemy of God so that you and I could become his friends. God's grace purifies our worldliness. That's his response to us. Check out our response to him. He says in verse 7, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Submission is all about repentance. It's all about turning away from our sin and ourself and turning to God in surrender. That we would submit to him, that we would no longer believe that we're in control of our own lives, that we would submit to him as the Lord and as the king because he is. Repentance or submitting to God is a change of mind that leads to a change of action. Right, and there's a lot of times in our lives, a lot of people who want forgiveness, but they don't want repentance. Right, we want our circumstances to change, but we don't always want to change our hearts. He says, God's grace will purify your worldliness, but you've got to submit to him. He says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's all about fighting our sin. Man, at some point, we've got to make up our minds that we're going to remove ourselves from the things that are worldly and against God. Right, so if I'm a person who, who burns with the desire of the flesh, it doesn't make sense for me to watch entertainment and shows that indulge those things. Guys, turn off shows like Game of Thrones. If you're a young person and you're in a relationship that is leading you away from Christ instead of to him in your purity, you need to get out of that relationship. Or maybe get some godly boundaries in there. If you have uh, work and your children's sports and activities keep you away from the, the gathering of the people of God and the preaching of his word every week, cut some things out of your life. He says, resist the devil, fight against his temptations. Here's the thing, a lot of us are not walking in victory and godliness over our worldliness because we've stopped resisting. We've gotten comfortable. We've stopped fighting. He says, God's grace purifies your worldliness, but you've got to submit. And I've got to hurry up. <laughs> he says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. How many of us have ever been in the place where we felt like God was just not close to us? Right, where God was just distant from us. Here's the thing that we know. If you've ever been in the place where God is distant from you, it is not because he's hiding from you. God is not playing a cosmic game of hide and seek, right? He wants to be found by you. He wants to be present and active in your life. He says, though, you've got to draw near to him. You've got to be pursuing him. You've got to be doing the things like reading scripture and praying in order to develop your relationship with him. <laughs> Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, by Satan, he had to resist the devil in the wilderness. He was tempted with the same three things that you and I are tempted with. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, boastful pride of life. That's what Jesus was tempted with. And the way that he resisted those things was because he was constantly drawing near to his father. He was able to say, it is written. In the scripture, it is written, it is written, it is written. And so Jesus is able to resist the devil because he was drawing near to God. 
in the heat of the moment, in the heat of the temptation, it is too late to say, hang on a minute, Satan, let me go find some armor real quick. Right? It's too late to go try to draw near to him in the heat of the moment. So we've got to draw near to him before the temptation comes. Then he says this, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Now, this one might be the most difficult um, to apply to our lives. Right? Nobody in here enjoys being convicted and broken over your sin. That's not an enjoyable thing. Nobody um, pulled up in the parking lot this morning like, you know what? I hope in the very first verse, James is going to call me an adulterer for my sin. <laughs> right? We want, we want light and fluffy. We want, uh, we want to feel good. We want to laugh. But here's the thing, guys. Sin against the living God is not light and fluffy. He says, you got to be broken. If you want to be healed, you got to be cut. If you want to be elevated, you got to be lowered and see your sin the way that God sees it. Are we making excuses for our sin or are we broken over it? James says that God purifies our worldliness, but we've got to submit to God. God is against our worldliness. God purifies our worldliness in his grace. Here's the third thing, and we'll go home on this. Verse 11. God calls us to love others through their worldliness. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. To be a judge of another person, guys, means to stand over them in condemnation, right? It's where we become experts about how everybody else is worldly. And if we're not careful, we can be those who receive the more grace of God that cleanses all of our worldly junk and then think it's our responsibility to go around blasting everybody else for theirs. He says, don't speak evil against a brother or sister in Christ. And I love what he says here, that if you're a judge of the law, it doesn't make you a doer of the law, it makes you a judge. Meaning, being able to call out everybody else's flaws doesn't make us flawless. Now, he's not talking about um, being discerning about somebody else's sin, calling another brother or sister in, in Christ to repentance and faith back in Jesus. He's not talking about that. He's talking about standing over them in condemnation especially in the way that you speak about that person to other people, right? So he says, don't speak evil against them. Don't slander, don't gossip maliciously. Then he says this in verse 12. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy, but who are you to judge your neighbor? Guys, you and I are those who have received grace from the great God and judge of all men. Remember, God purifies, his grace purifies our worldliness. When we receive that grace, it calls us to be gracious and long-suffering and understanding with other people who struggle, especially if they're in the faith. God calls us to love others through their worldliness. Right? They don't need your slander. They don't need your gossip. They don't need you to, to condemn them. They need your grace. They need you to act like you remember what it was like when you didn't have it all together. And again, I don't know about you. I know about me. That don't take a whole lot of remembering. God calls us to love others through their worldliness. If you're able to call out something that's wrong, you ought to be willing to step to them and say, I want to show you how to get it right. Right? What if our first reaction to a brother or sister's worldliness was not to say, I'm going to talk about you, I'm going to talk to you. And in a spirit of, of Galatians 6, 1, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. God calls us to love others through their worldliness. 
And guys, I'm, I'm the discipleship pastor here, and so I'm going to throw a plug for community groups right here. The only way that you can apply this passage with, with showing love and, and calling brothers and sisters lovingly out of their worldliness, the only way you can exercise this is in biblical community. Right, where real people with real issues in real life take their worldly tendencies and parallel park them on your last nerve. Right, God uses the good and the bad and the ugly of community to uproot our worldliness and to help us love others through theirs. God is against our worldliness. God's grace purifies our worldliness. And God calls us, you and me, to love others through their worldliness. And this is a challenging text, isn't it? James says that to love the world, to have these worldly tendencies make us unfaithful to God. Make us adulterers in our relationship with God. And every single one of us know how, how, how astounding of a claim that is. What an offense that is. I was talking to a marriage counselor this week. They said they've been counseling marriages for 15 years and still the number one offense in a marriage is adultery. Now, God can heal that. Praise God, the gospel can redeem that. The gospel can restore that. But nevertheless, it's a, a serious offense which makes the gospel that much more scandalous. <laughs> that James says you're loving the world, you're unfaithful to God, yet he gives you more grace. God's got even more grace than what was happening in Charlottesville, Virginia this weekend. Blows my mind, it should blow yours. Jesus can reconcile what seems humanly possible or impossible to reconcile. Jesus' blood shed on that tree can wash away all your offenses and give you a new heart, one that desires the things of God and not the things of the world. He can reconcile it, but you've got to submit to him. He gives more grace, but he calls us to submit. If you're here this morning and you've never submitted your life to Christ, we would love to talk to you about what that looks like. He is the worldly, forgiving, all-powerful Son of God who died in your place to make you right and to make you the friend of his Father. Let's pray. Mm. Father, we thank you so much for more grace can't get that word out of my mind. The gospel makes no sense at all. May it be that we would stand in awe of your love for us this morning. If there's somebody here who's constantly being tempted and, and torn and pulled towards the things of the world, may, be, may we be warned that that makes us the enemy of God, but may we also be encouraged that that same God is pursuing us with more grace in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Purify our hearts this morning. If we've got a brother or sister in Christ that is, is engaging in worldliness, may we not be their judge. May we come and be their encourager to call them back to faithfulness to their God. So that those who don't know you can watch the way we give grace and receive grace and all of it points to Jesus. There's a person here who doesn't know Jesus as their Savior and Lord. They've never submitted their life to him. Please come and do that this morning as we stand together. Amen.